Awesome, we're back. Had some lunch. Decided to make some more progress rather than leave it for today. Had a bit of a breakthrough as well with the diff. Um, so you can see I'm using black screws here. Um, I found they're a much better fit. Uh, having a look in the, uh, the available parts here, I did see there were some black screws um, of the exact same size. The issue is I've only got three, um, not four of them. But uh, they definitely seem to work a bit better. So I checked my uh, parts bin and I happen to have a whole lot of those screws. I've got like, do I have it here? Let's pull my atomic parts stuff. So I keep a, a box specifically for atomic parts. Um, and oh, it's hard to see. I've got a whole lot of screws in the bottom there. Um, it's basically every single screw from every single atomic kit all into one. So had some spares and put them in and um, so the diff is now built. Uh, it's not that smooth. In fact, it's incredibly harsh. Um, so I'm a bit torn as to what I do here. On one hand, I can leave it and then let the motor run it in. And I'm very, very tempted to do that. I'm also not sure if I want a solid diff. I haven't been able to find any information about whether or not you want a solid diff with a rear wheel drive car. Um, but following the instructions, it looks like you're not supposed to fill it with oil or grease. Yeah, I can't see any read. They, they don't actually say there, so. Oh, actually, I've missed two screws. Um, are these sixes? If they're sixes, I might just use these ones and turn on automatically. Yep, they are. So maybe I was supposed to have a whole pile of... Oh, maybe there's supposed to be a 4 mil variant, but I can't see any other black screws in there. So I'm just going to call the atomic documentation bad, as well as their choice of having way too many screws. So let's just twist that in. Uh, good, I'm actually streaming. Oh, and that's locked it actually up solid. So maybe if I want to go solid, I can just do it with this screw. And back it off a bit more. Oh, that's so harsh. So I definitely have the normal diffs. I don't... I do have a spare DRZ diff from the DRZ1. And I could pull that out if I feel the need to, but I've got a feeling that one's filled with grease at the moment. So let's just push on with this and we can always come back to it. Unfortunately the rear end can be a bit difficult and annoying to repair after the fact so okay. I suspect once I hit this with uh, some high speed rotation uh, that should all become nice and smooth. Okay and I know if I tighten up now it's going to get very very um, It's going to lock itself, which is good to know. So it means I can just adjust the tension as required. That's a bit too rough. Back it off a bit, rotate it. Yeah, there's just some edges there. So I inspected the gears before I put it in there and I couldn't see anything. Like, all these gears look fine, but for whatever reason they bind quite a bit. So let's just move on in that case. Um, not really in the mood to diagnose it too much. Rear suspension. Interesting. So that's definitely rear suspension. Other parts. I keep on thinking I've missed a bag here. Oh, my coffee's still there. I completely forgot about that. And I didn't finish it. I'll leave it for the moment. Let's take a closer look. So that's a motor mount. It's the top plate. There's the swing arms. Server mount there. Uh, 
box is definitely empty. Let's have a quick look around. Nothing there. Is that it? No, that is liquid metal. Um, shocks. Hacker slider servo. No, sorry, gyro. Hmm. I think I'll just open this bag and see what happens. Let's move you there. Oh yeah, there they are. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so what do we need? We need bearings. Two point fives and twos. So where are my bearings? Where are my bearings? Actually, this is interesting in itself. So they said it. They've got a very, very specific bearing size here. And I've got a feeling I've used that bearing in the steering setup. One point five eight, one point six, two point one seven. But to be honest, I'm not terribly bothered by that because I do have these mm, okay so that's likely for a shaft which is likely this thing here yep that's a good fitment so is that so I want something a bit wider what looks good here? It's probably one of those rare bearing sizes I don't keep many of. There we go. Yep, that looks like a good fit. Yep, same dimensions. I'll just steal one of those. <clears throat> and I'm not going to bother with the fact that it's on the steering servo. It might mean the steering's a bit higher than normal, but if that's an issue, I'll just have to re disassemble the front end. So let's take two of those. I'm more worried about the bearings being somewhat asymmetrical. So let's chuck these on the outside in that case. Looking at the manual. Oh, where's my reaming tool? There we go. No, not a good fit. Why is that? Let's try flipping it over and seeing if it's just something to do with the bearing. No. So it's just a really bad fitment. I've got words for you, Atomic, and they're not pleasant. See how that goes. It's better, but it doesn't want to stay in. There's something at the top preventing it from. Oh, you know what? Maybe I've just got this in the wrong side. Let's take a closer look. Mm -hmm. So these sh these are asymmetrical. Yep, and I'm trying to force it in the wrong side, so... Bingo. That's all it was. Uh, I guess the moral of this story is pay attention. There we go. Two bearings. Um, what next? Let's go on the inner bearings. So we need that. And we want those two. And we push them in the side of the gear. Which way do I want to do it? I want to have the balls facing on the inside. 
so they don't catch dirt. And that's not working, so it must be the smaller bearings I've got here. Look at two of those. And one half shielded on one side and balls on the other. So let's put balls on the inside. And just so that we don't we can worry about contamination and all this. So I need a pin for that, which is a 1.9812 pin. So I need a 12 mil shaft. Yep, you'll do. Let's put you through. No, you're loose. So I likely need the bigger one. And you're similar dimensions, so let's go with that. Yeah, I mean, this is another thing. Why would you use multiple different size shafts as well? There's no real benefit. It just seems like bad design. There we go. So I've got a wheel, all gear there. It's hard to see on camera, but that's actually moving really, really, really smoothly. Um, now we want the bigger gear. So let's do a test fit. Oh, that's a bit tighter. And that gets a collar as well. Now this does have direction, so they don't indicate it, but there's holes only on one end, so there's no hole down this end here. Um, and looking at the uh, the image, it looks like we have to put the gear on like that, right? Because if you have a really close look at the end there, I don't know if you can see it on camera. Let me move it up. You see how it's got uh, space for a pin? So I'm assuming we slide this up like that, put the pin through that hole there, and then push the gear over the top of that. So let's put the spacer on there. Yeah, and in fact, they do tell you to do that. If you have a look, really close look at the image here, um, just about here, they mention a pin. So they really haven't thought that image through at all. That's actually really, really hard to tell what you need to do. Um, so once again, I think Atomic has dropped the ball on their instructions. But this, to me, in my mind at least, um, it's more than likely that they've just built it and they understand all the different parts and they probably haven't tested it by getting other people to go off and build it and see if there's some sort of assumed knowledge which the uh, the people writing the instructions aren't aware that they have. Um, so what do I mean by that? So if you've built these things a couple of times, you might not necessarily write things down because you just, you know it um, and you forget that you know it. But for people coming along with no prior experience, they're going to hit these issues and start scratching their heads. So it's why you should always make sure that when you're writing documentation like this, you get someone who doesn't know the subject matter to go over the documentation and make sure it's all easily understandable by um, someone who doesn't have context. And I don't think they've done that here. So I've got a collar, it goes in there like that. One thing to do is make sure that the gears all line up and they rotate freely. Let's put that on like that, and that looks good. I can tell if I put a bit of tension on this, it's it doesn't move nearly as freely, but it depends on where that tension is. So we'll have to be careful when we're assembling this to not stress that um, the mechanicals too much. So I've done the shaft, I've done the pin on the shaft, I've done the other pin that holds that gear, I've done both pinions, and I've done four bearings. So let's go on to the next one. Okay, so now we're assembling more, some more carbon fiber. And it looks like someone else is watching, which is, I must admit, weird. I don't expect these streams to actually be popular or something someone wants to watch, but that's fine. Um, actually, let, let's just make sure I've got chat visible in case someone asks a question. Okay, so 
this is a bit interesting. If you have a look at this, you can actually see this bottom part is recessed. Yeah, see where it's a bit lighter? That actually has to go up because the big rear diff actually fits into that. Um, whereas the bottom uh, is actually tapered. Tapered, is that the right word? Actually, I'm just having a look at the, the cut on the carbon fiber. I originally thought that was a good cut. I'm starting to think it's not. I can just see distinct layer lines. So I'm guessing they've CNC'd it um, in three or four passes, in depth passes, rather than have a smooth finish. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. Like the cuts seem good, but it's the first time I've actually seen that stepped effect. So we'll see what happens. Um, we're now putting the chassis on, so I need flat heads and a button head. So I'm going to do the button head first, just to keep this assembly together. I'll just make maneuvering things a bit simpler. So they want a button head, and that's not, well I need two of those anyway, so let's pull those out. Um, and they want a button head. And I don't really like how they mix um, Phillips head and hex all throughout this design. It, that's That was a bad mistake on their part. Very bad mistake. So that's 4.2. Thread is 4. So I'm going to use you. Um, I'm going to pull out my good screwdriver. There we go. So just slide that in like that. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, it's biting now. Okay, cool. And this side, yes, this side. So we just wind that in. This is where the ball bearing works really, really well. Like, I love this screwdriver. So, so, so good. Now, there's a trick we can do for tightening here. Um, if I can find a good part for that. I could use uh, one of the Allen keys, but I'm just going to use one of my screwdriver heads and put it through the hole there. And that just provides some a lever to make sure that that's tight. So I want to make sure it's not too tight. I want it to be freely rotating. And that seems pretty good. Due to the way this bearing is done, so the inner sleeve is pushing up against the bearing. And the bearing, uh, the screw is also pre pressing on the bearing. Now both of those are pressing on the inside of the bearing, so that means we can load it with a lot of force and it's not going to cause any uh, deformation of the bearing. So it's alright for us to tighten it, but you should always check these things and uh, make sure it's all running smoothly. Um, if you've got a load on the outside um, and then a load on the inside, if you tighten it too much that will cause the, the bearing to like be pulled like that way. Um, and the bearing will then be slightly off center and it won't run smoothly. So uh, if you've got that sort of load, you actually don't want a bearing. I can't remember what it's called. There's a different type of bearing where it's got a whole lot of balls in a circular plate and then there's two plates that um, load it. I guess it's, it wouldn't be a radial bearing, it'd be a lateral bearing or something like that. Uh, cool, next step, we're securing to the platform. Also, I should always point out when I'm doing this sort of stuff that I may say things that are wrong. So if you think I'm saying something wrong, don't necessarily follow my advice blindly. Do some research or reach out to me and I might be able to help you in that arena and also correct where I've made a mistake. Um, especially when I'm tired, I don't necessarily say what I mean. So this is actually a tight fit. Um, I'm just trying to so you see how it's got two cutouts I'm trying to slide it in but it's not going terribly smoothly so I could force it in for a tight fit but I think I wanted to shave off just a tiny bit of material from each side not too much just enough to make it slide in smoothly with a tiny bit of force so these diamond files work well for that Uh, so I realize just how much streaming I'm going to be doing today. Um, I'm kind of glad I'm not a full-time Twitch streamer. I might even have trouble calling myself a Twitch streamer. But uh, 
by the end of this weekend, I'll have probably uploaded about eight hours worth of content. And my God, that takes a lot of effort. I, I could not sit in front of a computer for that long just playing games. Well, maybe I could, but um, I kind of liked taking a break for lunch. So if I was going to do it, I'd probably take a different approach and stream in small two-hour segments. Um, I watch one or two streamers that do do it full-time, and they are on stream for nearly eight hours straight, maybe with like a half-hour gap in between. Um, and I don't think that's really fair on themselves or the people watching their stream. Like, that's a big commitment. Okay, that's still a bit too tight. And we just file it back a bit more. I, I mean, for all my complaints about the Atomic chassis, um, it actually has been going together really, really, really quickly. Um, a lot faster than I thought. Um, so going back to that Twitch streaming um, and how I said I'd do it two hours at a time, when building the Mini Zeds, the custom ones, I found it's very, very similar. I can only really do two hours at a time and then I have to get up. Um, and just stretch my legs and get something to eat or something. I've made the mistake of just pushing through it and doing like, I think once I did like six hours straight and by the end of it, it took so much out of me. Uh, okay, so that's looking better. I just have to make sure it sits flush with the chassis. It's not, but I've got a feeling the screws will fix that. So let's move on to the screws in that case and just test that theory. These are hex so let's chuck that in and let's start twisting that in and that's going in really 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 smoothly and I can feel it mating with the chassis now so once again don't over tighten um, it's possible to strip out the plastic very very easily so just enough to be uh, level with the uh, the carbon fiber here um, you don't want it protruding even slightly, so I'd run your fingernail or um, your screwdriver over it, just like that. And you should be able to feel it going in rather than pushing up. And I can feel that one's pushing up, so let's dig that in a bit more. And the reason being is if you're going over carpet, uh, that will catch on the carpet. And cause you to spin out. Oh, they're both sitting up, to be honest. And I've got a feeling if I talk it anymore, I'm going to strip it out. So I'm just going to leave it like that. The leading edge seems to be level with the carbon fiber, but the rear edge seems to be protruding slightly. But I'm somewhat happy with how this is going. So, um, I mean, worst comes to worst, I'll bring, I'll, I've actually got replacements for the, I've got the M4s uh, on hand, and I've got much better screws for that. So I can always use them. Okay, so I think 12 is done. We've done one screw, three screws, yep. Uh, let's now work on the rear arms with the down stops. Now, I actually don't use the down stops a lot. Um, I fit them, and they're fiddly, and I wish I didn't have to do that, but these are M4s. Uh, let's go with that. Uh, but I've never had a reason to adjust the uh, adjust them, so... I don't really feel they're needed. In fact, there's already an M4 in there. What the hell? I don't know if I did that myself or I was not expecting it. Let's back it out just a tad because I want it to be level with the plastic, not with the screw. And another half a rotation. Perfect. Now I can't actually see any other black M4s. So black 4mm with that head size. So I'm going to refer back to my atomic kit where I do know I have some. That looks promising. In fact, let's grab you and compare you in head size. Yep, you're exactly what I want. 
So, I mean, this, this is one of the reasons why I keep parts on hand. It's because if I'm building stuff like this, it's just so convenient. And especially with my custom builds. So the other day I was doing the um, MA030 build with the counter steer. And I needed some very, very particular screw types. So I needed screws that were longer than the standard screws. Um, and luckily I had a whole bunch on hand from another kit. So this was to adjust the Eagle Racing diff. Um, and make sure that protrudes through and then back it off. Good, that's through. Good. And the reason I protruded that one is there's a bit of material that needs to be cut off. Um, if I don't remove that, then when it means the arms are not going to level come down to the same level and that will lead to asymmetry, asymmetry in the chassis which is really what you don't want so let's just clean that surface up good and while we're at it we'll do the other one as well which looks clean but mm, maybe I do need to back that off a bit more okay I was going to say where's my knife but I realize I'm wearing a jacket and that just slid up my arm. So given that that's a knife, that could have been very, very dangerous. Especially if I went up to the shops like that and didn't realize it and just suddenly pulled out a knife. Not that that happens. Wink, wink. No, it doesn't actually happen, but... Uh. Okay, so there's some ball cups on the inside there. Yes, I can see them. Let's just click these into here because they should be... No, they don't actually retain, but let's see how much wobble they have. No wobble, which is great. And no wobble, which is great. So that's pretty awesome. Is that the part I want? Yes, it does look like it is. So let's mock everything up. And now this is a very weirdly shaped piece. So I'm going to have to follow the instructions to make sure I get it in right. And basically it latches over the end. So this is going to require a bit of finessing. So I've got one side retained. I'm just going to redo the other. And we've got both. And then flick it over to the bottom and just manage to push it in. So that arm's moving really, really nicely and so is that. Um, now there's an interesting question of how much we want to stuff around with this to make these have no resistance. And I'm going to make the effort and do that. As much as I hate doing that stuff on stream. So I've got the feeling that from there to there is slightly too long and it's pushing on either side like that and that's what's causing the resistance so we'll be taking some material off the end and in fact oh yeah I can feel spur lines there that really needs a clean up so they provide the 1000 I'm gonna go straight to the 3000 and clean that up so you just do it by rotating the outside and then we'll deal with the end separately like that and I can feel those mold lines have been removed let's do the other one now because of the way this um, ball head is actually loaded uh, it swings up and down so the force is around the outside so you only have to clean that side and then you only have to clean the ends because it, it could possibly be binding on the ends um, so you don't need to go all the way over and make sure it's perfectly polished. You only really have to focus on two areas. Okay, that's good. How about you? And you're, you're a bit better, but not much. Uh, so we polish you up. And then we do the end. Yeah, it's feeling a bit better. So it'll be interesting to see if this is sufficient or if I'll still have to take some material off the ends as well. Cool. Let's put the 
this all back together. Uh, that's already feeling a lot better. Um, but we won't know until we get this part back in. Uh, so these parts are very, very black, um, which is not normally an issue, but there's not a lot of contrast between them. Um, so even if I was able to hold it up, it's not likely going to be as useful as you'd think. So they're freer. This one's a bit better. So I'm going to have to take some off the end there. And I think I'll use a diamond file for that. If I twist that up, yeah, that's how you do it. Uh, when I did the front end, I mocked everything up um, and then undid it. For the front end, that's fine because it's relatively simple to get on and off. But uh, for this stuff, at least this particular part, the bottom suspension arms on the rear, um, it's recommended to do, I recommend doing that before continuing. Uh, so you don't have to remove a whole lot of, more, most importantly, plastic parts. Uh, plastic parts wear quite a bit when you um, remove screws. So you want to try and minimize the amount of, um, I guess, screw in and outs. Basically, don't screw around. Screwing around is bad. And it's even funnier that I can make that joke because no one's watching at the moment. So... Let's do you, pop you back in on, twist. Oh God, there's so much delicate work, which is why I hate this stuff. Don't really mind the filing, it's just when you need three hands to do something and you need to need a lot of ultra fine precision work. I just, I can't do the precision work anymore. Squeeze that down, that's looking good. See, just a tiny bit of filing, really, really good effect. So I've only got a tiny bit more to do on this side. I'll just take two passes on either side. Cool. Now how much you take off, I did mention this in the last video, but if you look at the file and read the specs on it, you can work out how much you take off in each pass. That's actually dependent on a couple of things. How much of the uh, file you use and how hard you push as well. So I pushed a bit harder than was probably necessary there. Um, but that's fine. It's more about the results. So That one's binding a bit still. And that's because I pushed the little thing forward. If I pull it back, it works perfectly. So what I'm going to do is test fit the screws, I think. M27 flatheads. Yeah, let's test the screws and see what that does. And we'll back out the screws and retry again if there's too much binding. Once again, measure your screws. You don't want to be screwed. And double check the screws are the same length. It's always a good... They are, it's just more of a matter if they mix M, if they mix uh, six mil and seven mil screws, um, because the measurements are off, sometimes you can end up putting the wrong one in. And that might not be a problem now. It might be a problem when you go to put the long, longer screw in a shorter hole and you end up breaking things. This one side down. No protrusions. It's important to push from the top because we've got a uh, triple layered structure here and you want everything to line up. You don't want to gap at all because that will make things... And you want to do it right the first time. If you end up with a gap and then you try and undo it and rewind it, um, you'll find it's very, very difficult to overfight that initial uh, gap to problem. So, yep, looking good. I'm going to call that a success. I'm going to tighten this up a bit more. Not too much. Just enough to be level with the carbon fiber. The plastic's going to do most of the retention. Plastic's also really good at resisting um, uh, things unscrewing. So the problem with metal parts is while they're stronger, um, unless you're loctiting them, the vibration will cause them to come undone. Uh, 
that's less of a problem with the plastic parts. It's not, it doesn't eliminate the problem, but it definitely makes it less of a problem. Also, I have to check one thing, but I think I've decided on the Celica for the body. So we'll be sizing it to that. Um, I just have to check if that is actually a four wheel drive or a rear wheel drive car. Because uh, I want to remain faithful to the real chassis. Um, if it is a rear wheel drive car, we'll go with it. Um, I think the Subaru was a uh, four wheel drive or all wheel drive. Um, then there's a Lancia Delta, which is that smaller Lancia. I think that's a four wheel drive as well. Um, and then finally there's a Stratos. I don't really want to make the Stratos a drift car, but we'll see what happens. Maybe I will. I, I really want that to be more of a shelf queen. So done two screws, we've done the arms. Let's do one of the important parts. We need a brass spacer, we need it on that hole, we need an M24 button head, which is that. And we need an M23. So we're going to have to measure this one. So I think we've got some M24. Yeah, that's an M24. So I need something shallower. That's probably an M23 there. Yep, right on the dot. So yeah, always double check your sizes. Let's put you through there. Oh good, they were, they were smart enough not to thread the motor mount. If the motor mount is threaded and you're going into plastic, that's when you have to clamp everything. Um, and it's best to only have one thing that you thread into or that is already pre-threaded. It just makes the entire process a bit more reliable, actually. That goes there. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. So I didn't want to do it, but I'm going to have to use the tweezers here. Um, and I'm just going to line everything up like that. Perfect. Now I'm going to, that's got an indentation there and then this side has a cutout or is rounded for the screw. So make sure you're using the right size here. Put that over the top. Squeeze that down onto the pin. Find you. Do some fine motion to get you into place. Cool, and you're a hex head, so we go down and we tighten you up. Oh, whoops, I shouldn't have that. That'll make things simpler. I only tighten you lightly, and then we attach from the bottom. So if you're screwing in from two separate dimensions, so say X and Y or Z and Y or Z and X, um, don't over tighten, get all the screws in and then tighten up. Just because you can have alignment issues otherwise. That's in, that's very, very smooth. A bit worried about that, but it looks tight. I don't think I can slide any paper underneath that, which would be an indicator that it's loose, but I don't feel that's as tight as it should be. Like that should probably be a, because it's going into plastic, um, a self-tapping screw. And I don't actually see any self-tapping screws here. So uh, let's feel, yeah, I'm going to call that good enough. Um, okay. So now we get onto the fun part, which is a spur gear. Now, as I've said before, they use a spur gears like the SZ and the BZ3 range. So I can reuse a lot of my spur gears if I want to change the ratio. But the one thing I like about these is they're really, really well designed and they're very, very easy to change. So um, it's probably one of the better designs I've ever seen. Uh, like if Atomic does one thing right, they're, um, 
spur gear stuff is exceptional. If we can get you on, so with the rubber band. So as you can see here, can you? Probably not enough. Well, there's enough contrast there. So I've got a rubber band here um, holding the pin in. There's just a little recess there. And you wouldn't think that that would work, but it's actually an incredibly robust solution and allows a bit of movement, which is good. Um, do, 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 do. That goes on there. I need a O-ring. I've done that. M234. Yep, okay. So that just goes on arm down. Oh, that's interesting. Is there a pin? Yes, there's a 1.5 pin. So this will be this will be where it gets difficult. So you, you will probably want to rotate it so it's like that. Um, a little trick is to put the tweezers in the hole and leverage it up. Yep, and that definitely presents a lot more room. So before I couldn't see the exact hole, which means it was going to be very, very hard to get the pin in. Get the pin past the way in, push through. Just be very, very careful and take your time. Make sure you've got no distractions or anything when this is happening. Pin goes on like that. Push that back. Put that on the top. And then rotate it. And I can feel those gears moving, so that's good. And now we just screw in the top. Uh, what do we want? An M24. And we want a button head. So I think you're an M24. Let's just check. Yes, good enough. So we want to secure that as soon as possible so that pin doesn't fall out. Um, it's very, very easy to lose a pin and not realize it. I've done it on Mini Zs and I've done it on larger models as well. So that's now binding. So it's going to back that off. That's still binding. Back that off even more. And that's still binding quite significantly. So I'm just going to go back to the drawing board for a sec. Uh, pin goes in. Yep. Did I not have a bearing there? Sure, I put a bearing on the outside. Let's just check and confirm that. I may end up putting a shim in here, just so that the bearing is loaded up correctly. And that pin fill out, so when removing the spur gear, you've got to take note of that. Yeah, I think I am going to put a shim in here. Which is not going to be something that's included in the kit, I can assure you. But it is something I should have handy, so... Are you big enough? No, you're not. You're asymmetrical, because you are for offsetting tyres. And then you should be able to go in without any issue. Could do another one, but I think that will be fine. So we do that. Now, if you're using tweezers to put pins in, be very, very careful that you don't apply too much force um, or you will send them across the room. Uh, if you can get rubber coated ones, or plasti dip them, that is definitely recommended. You will tear out a lot less of your hair that way. And then we just go on the end with that. So we go on the end with that. Yep, there we go. Now that is a bit weird. Uh, so I'm getting a tiny bit of binding and it's rubbing against, oh, uh, you know what? It's actually rubbing up against that 
button head there, so that's obviously not in far enough. So we're going to back that out and see if I've got a smaller one. How about you? Are you smaller? No. I'm almost at this point thinking about just abandoning their screw guides and just picking whatever I think works. That might work. No, you're a recessed head. I also get the feeling I'm going to end up with a lot of leftover screws because I think they give you m just a random selection of screws rather than exactly what you need. I'm not particularly happy with any of the screws here. Oh, you do seem a bit shorter. Let's go with you. I wonder if it's just due to manufacturing that some of the screws are a bit too long and their the dimensional accuracy is a bit off. Yeah, that, that's a much tighter fit. Okay. I'm actually kind of surprised that's not a recessed screw. Um, it's like one of those occasions where that would make a lot of sense. Okay, that's better. It's not perfect. Uh, the head on that screw is too high. I actually don't know if I believe them on that uh, button head. So we're going to do something very, very interesting here. Um, it's one thing you've heard me talk about a lot and you haven't actually seen me do a lot. And that's, we're going to custom fabricate a part. So I think this is justified. Um, the screw head is a bit too high, but it's a hex head and it goes in quite deep. So we're going to take a couple of layers off the top. Normally I'd be very, very cautious about doing this on a screw because you might uh, end up taking so much that you can't actually screw it down. But the head goes so far in on this one that it's probably going to be fine. And I've got enough replacements that I can always just grab another one. So these feel like hardened screws. Um, looking at the amount of damage I'm doing to the surface, these definitely look hardened. So, uh, one thing I probably want to do is get a bit more leverage on the screw. There we go. So we gra grasp it by the shaft there, so the head's sticking out. And we just line it up and push down and apply a bit of pressure. So we get some more cutting force behind it. Um, now it was actually clearing. What I'm concerned about was when I put force on one side, uh, it definitely was catching. So because of that, we want to take off a bit of space just so that if it wobbles for whatever reason or it's off balance or something, we don't end up ripping the car apart or causing damage is probably a better way of putting it. So there's no hard or fast guide as to how much you need to take off. It's just going to be doing test fitments and I'm eyeballing this as well because looking at it from the top, it doesn't work too well, but looking at it from the side, it's a lot easier to see how much material is coming off. Yep, okay, I'm happy with that. We'll do a test fit now. Okay. So I can definitely feel that there's less surface area to screw against. Um, but it's more than enough to catch. We won't be talking it too tightly anyway, so. Let's do that. Let's drop the pin in. I normally do it with pliers. So you can drop it in from the top and when it goes in, rotate at 90 degrees. Um, providing you've got the control to do it. 
problem is I'm turning it more than 90 degrees and it's falling out again. Let's do that. Go in there. It's not even in. Okay, let's just cheat. Rotate it. It can also help if your tools are magnetized, but that can actually work against you, especially when it comes to pins like this. Uh, and I know that these are partially magnetized, so I have to be a bit careful. What, what can happen is, depending on how you pull your tweezers out, you may end up pulling the pin out as well. Yeah, that's still rubbing. That's really, really bad. I am not 100% sure what we want to do in this case. Let's push that pin back in. Oh yeah, and see, so I've got the pin magnetized and I accidentally pulled it out. Uh, that's not good. So let's just... And the more you interact with it, the more you're going to end up magnetizing the pin itself. Um, so if, you just, if you've just got a set of tools and this is your first build, you may not hit that problem, but as you use tools more and more, they'll become more and more magnetized. So magnetizer might actually be a good investment after a couple of builds. Cool, let's go with that. Let's put a button head in. Actually, maybe a button head is different to a dome. So that's definitely... That's a dome, that's a dome. I don't see anything I'd call as distinctly button head ish compared to the domes I've got there, so let's just put that in. Good. Let's back it off half a turn. This would probably be a good candidate to um, Loctite. With that. What's the time? Two o'clock. How long have I been streaming for? Nearly an hour. Good. Okay, so done all that. Let's do that. So these go on either side of the spur gear. Wait, no, sorry, diff. That's all locked down. Goes in like that. Okay, so that looks like it can go in either direction, which is good. Um, but I'm going to observe the direction they put it in, so let's go that way. And that all just snaps in. Oh, this is all tight, but it's tight in a way that the running the motor through it is going to fix a lot of these issues. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to do a high speed run with this motor and just fix this problem. Actually, we should probably start speaking about motors. I'm thinking about putting a 3500KV motor on here. Um, I'm specifically putting a censored brushless motor. The reason I'd put a censored in is because of the better speed. It allows you to go lower on the ESC. So you, um, you get better control over the low end and also gives you a bit more low end speed as well. So... 
The reason for that is that ESCs um, for brushless motors that are not sensored, so sensorless br uh, brush motors, um, use the feedback, the electromagnetic um, how do I put it? So when the motor is rotating and you're not providing electric force, it can actually provide uh, electricity back. And uh, the ESC uses will temporarily stop powering the motor and then observe the back EMF uh, or the backwards induced voltage from the, the motor rotating to try and determine what position the motor is at. Now, uh, brushless speed controllers are very dependent on motor position because depending on where you, what uh, orientation the motor is, um, depends on how much power it applies um, and in what direction. So you don't actually, if you apply too much power at the wrong time, you actually spend, uh, send the motor going backwards. Um, if you're going slow enough with a brushed, brushless motor, then from when you start, you actually can't sense what position the motor is in. And that's what the sensor, uh, the sensor harness does. Is it, it gives you feedback about what orientation the motor is at, even at those lower speeds. Um, turns out it's a little less inefficient, um, and it's better to do back EMF sensing. Uh, so some ESCs will actually do both. At low speeds, they'll use the uh, sensor harness, and then high speeds, they s uh, switch over to back EMF sensing. Um, but uh, you normally notice it, that a sensorless mode, like if it, if an ESC only does sensor mode, then you notice it because at the top end, the motor doesn't have quite as much punch, or it's not quite as fast, so... Just being careful not to over talk that. And it just has to be down with no gaps, not really holding together, which is a mistake I, I traditionally make is over talking this stuff. So awesome. So we're getting into some more interesting stuff now. Um, we need ball heads, so it's one of these ball heads, and we need a copper spacer. And there should be hex heads, so I can use this. Yep, perfect. Uh, how are we going? We're going pretty well. So just slowly screw in. If you've got good plastics, then this should be a pretty simple operation. So I've got a feeling that they're using good plastics. They just don't have good quality control or well-maintained machines. Yeah, look, that's got a screw in it as well already. And so does this one. Wait, I don't remember putting those screws in, so that's... I find that kind of weird. Let's do the other one. Um, bum, 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 bum. Okay, that's finger tight. What else? We need two bearings. Uh, shield on the outside. Just get them in position, don't try and push them in yet. Now, once you've got the bearings in, you can either use your uh, swing arms to force them in, but I'm going to use a proper tool for that. Well, not a proper tool, but let's do that. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention that might be useful to some people, so before we were um, reaming out these uh, arms and getting them to flow uh, really, really well, you can get uh, specific types of ball and reamers uh, to make that a very, very simple affair. Um, I don't, I haven't really felt the need for one of those, but every time I go online, I tend to order a new tool and that might be the next tool I order. I just don't know if they've got any in the mini Z scale, so. Which really shouldn't be an issue. Well, maybe it is an issue. I do have some uh, swing arm reamers for reaming out that arm there and making it flow freely. But uh, you actually find that they provided a screw, uh, sorry, a drill bit here. And that should be for uh, reaming out the dimensions of this um, to make it swing freely. 
So put the swing arms through. And don't worry about the bearings falling out. That always happens. Just make sure everything's smooth. And then also make sure you put a black retaining cap on because it'll make working with them a bit simpler. Um, I'm not going to be using these black plastic uh, nuts. I've got some proper Yeah Racing ones. And I've got some much better plastic Yeah Racing ones as well. Um, I just bought a whole bunch of them. But the plastic ones are considered disposable. You, you use them once and then you replace them. Um, the metal ones, you can probably do about half a dozen times and then you need to replace them. But the, uh, the nylock on them does wear out. But they're worth it on so many different levels. Like if you back these plastic ones out, um, which you may have to do if you weld is binding a bit, they're basically screwed at that point. Whereas the nylock ones, you can get in, tighten it all the way and then back it out and it's not too much of a problem. So we just do that. Just keeps it in if the camera can focus. Nice and simple. And the other thing to do is if you put a part down and then pick it back up, double check the bearing is still in there. Um, it's happened one too many times for me. That's annoying to fix up. And then we just twist that on. It doesn't even have to be straight, to be honest. I mean, you're going to be throwing these plastic ones away, so just for retaining. So I think there's 21 steps here, and I'm at step 16. So that's a good sign. Cool. So we're now going to insert the swing arms in. So we do that to line them up. Not really liking the friction here, so I'm going to prematurely file that back. And in fact, if you read the documentation, they're talking about filing anyway, so... Let's do... Working out how to file things uh, is... Seems like it's simple, but... Not really. Um, for example, I don't have a flat, like this is a cushiony surface, so it's not cutting as nearly as well as I want. But it's more about keeping the part orientated level to the uh, sandpaper and how you're going to go about that. That can actually be a bit difficult. Okay, that's a bit better. Now, it would be a mistake to only do this on the um, the hub, the, the rear wheel hubs. In fact, I can see, I'm going to post process this with a scalpel again. I can just see some spur lines, so. Just go over lightly. We're also going to post process the inside of these just to make sure everything's as smooth as possible. And in fact, talking about filing, this is how you get into really delicate places. You get a hard surface and use that to apply pressure. And we basically want to be polishing the insides here more than anything else. Um, these look pretty good already, but I just want to make sure that they're really nice and smooth. And when doing things like this, it's really a matter of um, if it looks stupid and it works, it's a solution. Uh, there's no real one true way to do a lot of this stuff. So, yeah, that's still way too tight. So I'm actually going to use a diamond file. Now, or actually, before I do that, I'm going to post-process both sides. Or pre -pro I'm going to process both sides. I don't even know why I'm calling it post-process. Um, because I don't want to shave material off these arms, I want to shave it all off the actual swing arms themselves. Oh, so the uh, wheel hubs. I just want to make sure the surface is good on these. Okay, 
good and always visually inspect them because that can indicate if you're applying pressure in the wrong place or unevenly the other thing is don't have then whatever you're using dig into your hand um, pro tip there uh, and I've lost my spot uh, that's what I was doing uh, have I done that? Oh, I'll just start again so let's do that side let's do that side and this side and then the other side um, another good piece of advice is to do things in batches it makes things go faster and you're less likely to forget things and I think it's that less likely to forget things which is the important part actually that needs some more post-processing there is a spur line there so the reason why the spur uh, lines or the uh, the flash lines are bad is because they stick out and they're unpredictable so that they'll actually give you unpredictable performance until you actually actively remove them um, like something could work in one direction but not the other or only at a specific angle so you want to file them off as soon as possible and in fact I might even take the scalpel to that So I'm not actually cutting like that into the plastic. I'm actually going from the inside and dragging out. That's all that's really required to remove the spur, um, at least at this scale. Um, if you go the other way around, you might end up cutting the plastic. So I need to change the angle on that a bit. looking good and file trying to file a spur line down with like sandpaper that's 3000 grit you're in for a hard time it's just going to take a long time there's no point in suffering from that and that's already made a pretty significant difference so we're going to diamond file this uh, this has some minor spur lines but if at least with the diamond file will take the spur lines off um, what's probably more important is this surface doesn't actually look flat um, and I find that a tad bit concerning so the file will take care of it being flat or not okay let's try the other side once again don't take too much material just keep on testing and we'll test on both sides. Okay, so one side's definitely tighter than the other. But that's fine. Oh, that's still a bit too tight for my liking. I'll take a bit more off. Oh, God, I forgot how much work this stuff is. don't know if I'm happy with that let's polish it up so we'll use the end of the caliper to do it so after using a rough file like that diamond file you should always be using a finer grain sandpaper um, just to take smooth the surface out a bit Yep, I'm going to call that a success. So let's get these pins in. And put that in the top. Do that, and then we have to fish around until we get the holes lined up. Or I could pull the pin out and then do it by sight. This is where a well-lit surface really helps. So. I'm just looking for orange through the hole and then just forcing the pin through when I find it. Okay, that's good. 
So I don't know about you, but that worked well before, but when I put that in, it doesn't look nearly as good. So we'll just pop that back out. Uh, maybe not. Oh, right. Okay, so there, it's actually smaller on this side, so it's hard to get out. There we go. So it's protruding a bit, and we just grasp that with the tweezers and pull that. There's that magnetic thing again. That will absolutely kill you if you're not careful. Pop. And we will go back to sandpaper, but I'm going to use a more aggressive 1000 grit. Okay, that's looking good. It's important to keep the uh, the part level throughout the entire stroke of the on the sandpaper. I'm probably not doing the best, but I um, don't really think that's going to be a problem. There's still some minor binding. So I'm just going to take off a minor amount and then switch over to the 3000 from now on. Okay. Uh, sucks to have a cold. Okay, so that's going through without any issue. Um, I'm just going to polish with the 3000 to make the surface finish even better. Awesome. Let's see how that works. Oh, that should be almost perfect. And the pin went in first go. So if I push the arm to the outside. Yeah, I'm going to call that a success. So now we want to lock the pin in place. There it is, there's a screwdriver. Don't use Loctite or anything, like the, there's a screw here for a reason. They can work, like, if you've got everything perfect, the forces are not going to push it out because there should be so little friction on the pin that it's not, not going to pop out. That said, that's not always the case. And having a look at this, I actually don't think this bottom uh, screw actually does anything. So I'm just going to try and force it out. Yeah. So the better alternative to like Loctite or something is actually a small bead of super glue on the end. That will keep it in, but it means if you need to, you can pry it off with just a scalpel. You can just cut it off like that and it'll pop off. Uh, the, the weaker and cheaper stuff, the better. Uh, you want it to retain, you don't want it to actually like lock up, uh, lock it in place. And you want the smallest, like I'd be using a toothpick to just dab the end there. It doesn't need to be much at all. Cool. I'm going to call this a good day so far. Okay, so that going to need some bit of rough filing work. Um, Take off a bit of the side. Um, bum, 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 bum. That's looking good. And we fit that in, and it's still very, very, very tight. So, a bit more work with this. And once it starts to loosen up, we'll go over to the 1000 grit sandpaper. I actually don't feel the diamond file is working all that well. Uh, on the plastics, but that's fine. Um, I might try with the uh, metal file in a second. Oh, 
it's just so tight. Let's go over to a metal file. Oh yeah, that's much better. You can feel that cutting a lot better. <laughs> yep, okay. That's now at a point where we want to go to the 1000 grit paper. It's 3000, that's 1000. We use a different side because you can start, you can see it's spoiling a bit. So. Cool, still no comments on chat, that's fine. This is mainly for YouTube rather than Twitch. Um, oh, okay, wow, that's actually pretty good on its own. I just want to polish that up in that case. And I don't think it'll need much polish. If you take off too much material, then it'll move, the uh, actual hub will move back and forward. And it's all right with a tiny bit of play, but it's ideally something you don't want. Yep, that looks good. And let's see how the pin goes. <laughs> it's close. There we go. Just a bit of force is all that was required. Take back the tweezers, push that down. So push that down. There we go. Does it meet our flip test? No. Okay. So that just means we need more polish with the 3000. Push that pin back out. This is where rubber coated tweezers are a lot better as well. Or if you've got them, there you go. My personal favorite Leathermans. So this is just a um, one of the Leatherman squirt variants. Um, is it actually is it the squirt? Maybe it's not. But uh, I think the most important part is it's got no knife on it. So I'd be careful about taking it on a plane, but technically it should be uh, safe to fly with. Regulations about that are pretty crazy these days. Okay. I think we do a bit of an extended effort here. Okay, that's looking pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, I can see some gaps. So I don't think it's... I think I've gone... I've had the part orientated slightly incorrectly, so... I'm actually coming at an angle and the surface aren't, aren't flat, but I think we'll be able to get away with that, so... Oops. Pull you out. Yep, so we've achieved our goal there. So let's just push the pin in like that. And then this has got a retaining screw as well, so we're going to tighten that up. But I'm guessing it doesn't actually do much in this particular setup. There's a screwdriver. I've got a very, very bad habit of losing my tools. Um, what I wouldn't I should get is like a magnetic holder for all of that, but maybe an, I've got a carbon fiber tool holder, but I found it wasn't actually particularly any good. So, okay, so that screw worked. The uh, retaining screw here doesn't appear to work very well. So we're actually going to swap that screw out. Oh, actually, I don't need to take that pin out. I just need to unscrew it. That's interesting, that's not coming out. That might be what the problem is. I don't think that's a correct diameter screw. Or that's been stripped. And if they did that at the factory, I'm going to be pissed. 
Yeah, that's not coming out. Let's put a scalpel behind it, see if we can pop it up. Oh, okay, is that a... Wow, that's been stripped. Either that, or it is a Micro Micro Torx. Yeah, it's not that. I've got ways to remove screws like this. I just don't like to use them because it's fairly destructive. No, I need something slightly larger. Moment no, either. Let's try the one I've got in here. It's way too large. Um, what other options do I have? I've got you. So one of the better ways to do this is to actually super glue a uh, screwdriver in there. I want to try and avoid doing that because there's so many things you have to be aware of and be careful with when you're doing that. Okay, I honestly think that that was installed by the factory and possibly stripped, but I'm not going to hold them to that because there's a good chance I did that as well. But we can grip the outside and rotate, so we're going to do that a couple of times. Oh, actually. Oh, you know why? Because that's actually not a screw. <laughs> that is embarrassing. Okay, so not the factory's fault, it's my fault. That's a butt on the head. They're reckoning M23. Should be one of these guys. Let's pull you out using tweezers. Are you an M23? I think you are. Yes, you are. Da, 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 da. So I'm going to have a silver one on one side and a black on the other, but that's fine. Not terribly torn up about that. I'm more concerned that that pin stays retained. There we go. It's, can you see that on camera? Yeah, you can. Let's do that. Just retain that. First we make sure the pin is in, which is not, uh, so push the pin in, and twist it all the way in. Now it doesn't actually have to provide a lot of force, it just has to be able to, yeah, that's good enough. Um, bingo, so we're looking pretty good now. Um, if we chuck, balance that into there. Uh, the arms can now rotate, which is good. Oh god, that's harsh. Okay, let's clean up first and move on to the next part. I'm going to put my tools all out in front of me rather than underneath my arm. Should make this just a bit easier. Okay, so this is a step I don't like. When they actually ask you to cut these, I need you. So at least they've got um, an indentation on it, but given that these are the only um, ball head cups or caps of this size, you'd think they'd just come the right length out of the factory. Um, Making a mistake here, I really should be cutting on something. There we go. Yep, that's straight. Okay. 
Oh, I should totally get some ice cream. I've got some in the fridge. Actually, that's the other reason why you want to be wearing glasses when doing something like this, or at least safety glasses, is that just almost flew up and got me in the eye, so... We're going to actually make this shorter with the file. I can remember where I put my files. There they are. And because we're having issues with the plastic, with the diamond one, I'm just going to use the metal one. So I can see the line that I've got to cut to. And we're just going to stop when we hit that line. Yep, that's good. And give this a final pass. Cool. Let's clean out the ends. Awesome. What do they want to do? Into the balls. So I did use this trick earlier and I'm going to use it again. I'm going to select a very, very fine tip for my tools and insert it sideways into these ball heads. And you'll see why, like that. Just makes torquing them up and putting the ball heads on a little bit easier. So, just taking a look at the thread to work out which direction I have to rotate them in. And then just making sure I've got everything straight. And that's a hard part. Make sure my thumb's on the top, which is a bit difficult. Maybe I won't be able to show this too well, so let me just optimize for myself getting this on rather than for viewing. Okay, and that's sliding on nicely. Actually, that's going on brilliantly. I'm just going to quickly check one thing. Okay. And they wanted 2.5 mil. Yeah, that's close enough. Back it off a turn. There we go, done. Twist that. This is another reason why you want, so I commented in my first build video that you want to be measuring these from the outside rather than the inside. If you're cutting parts, and that might, might be different from person to person, you really don't want to be measuring from the part you're cutting, but from the outside, which is a known good reference point. So it's kind of crappy that they've done that. Like if I cut this incorrectly, uh, measuring to 2.5 mil could be catastrophic. Um, whereas if you're measuring from the outside, it's immediately, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to be dead on every single time. Half a turn, there we go. Whatever, I don't actually care if I'm too accurate because I'm going to fix this up by hand later. So I'm going to check how does that ball move fairly well. Now, these cups I don't like. The reason being, have a closer look at that. See how tiny that little screw, uh, that little hole is? Very, very easy to break. Incredibly easy to break. So make sure you don't put too much pressure on that. Uh, they want the M1.2s and the 4s, which will be you guys. I really think the um, there should be more plastic there, and that they should be using bigger screws. 
Um, but that's just me. The other trick is to not put the ball in immediately. I'll show, show you what you mean. So it would be a mistake to put the ball in immediately. What you want to do is just get them in initially and then put the ball in. Because otherwise you've got too many parts you have to keep all aligned and together. And this is a pretty delicate operation to begin with. There we go, it just goes in. Not too far, just have it sitting up a bit. You just want it to retain to the other side. Blocking my own light, which is never good. It's better. Twist. And why can't I feel you biting in? It's not being retained. So we're going to swap angles so I can see you better. And that's why. And you've got to be very careful about twisting these screws because you can very easily break the plastic. So many ways you can go wrong in this step. Oh God. Oh, that was almost biting. Just take your time and just go slowly. There we go. So you now just push the cup up a bit. Once again, very, very gently. You then insert that into the side and compress it. It's now retained. And then you screw down. making sure everything's level while you're doing this. You don't want to um, have one side screw, uh, screwed in tighter than the other. You want it to be nice and even. You also want it to move very, very freely. So The uh, retention force on this is pretty good. Um, so that's why so it's not moving at all. So I'm just going to back it out a bit. Always back out by probably about a quarter to begin with. Yeah, a quarter is actually normally pretty good. And then an eighth just to dial it in. So that's still too tight. And then when, once it is freely moving, I'll show you another trick. Uh, actually, one good trick is to have it just latched up like that and then just start unscrewing until it falls down under its own power, like it did then. There we go. And then you just check visually and make sure that both sides are about level. Yeah, that looks good. So they're, they're screwed in roughly evenly. Wow, we are making exceptional progress today. Like I might actually get this finished in this session, which means I'll have a complete build done with electronics in about eight hours. We're at about hour six at the moment. Um, and I'd probably do the electronics tomorrow and then onto a drift session. <sighs> I actually wonder what that's for. Oh, that's the, that goes on the motor, that's right. I might even install the motor today because I know which motor I want. So I think I was talking about this earlier. I want to put a 35,000 kV on there because I don't want to do high speed drifting. I want to do low speed drifting. And the reason why you want to match your motor to the speeds you're going at rather than just putting the high speed motor in is it gives you more granularity. So I'm really big on resolution and granularity. And if you ever chat to me about these subjects, uh, about Mini Z control, um, I'll definitely be talking about that a lot. Um, so you want granularity or you want steps 
uh, on your throttle so that you've got accurate control over the motor speed. So the if you could get like 100, 100 hertz speed increments compared to 250 hertz speed increments, I'd definitely go for the 100 speed increments, at least for drifting. Um, the reason you want that is it just allows you to control your angles a bit finer. Um, I mean, there's nothing with putting a high speed motor on, but if you've got a high speed motor and you've got your throttle turned down to like 50%, um, perhaps your motor's just like, you're not using most of the potential of that motor. Uh, and the lower, lower speed motors tend to be a bit more, I don't want to say power efficient, but don't use as much power. Um, and so there is definitely actually a benefit from, you get a, a bit extra battery life, which is nice. Um, the advantage of having a high speed motor though is normally the torque. So the torque can allow you to accelerate up to your given speed faster um, and recover from differences in the surface causing more or less where you might require slightly more or less torque. So that's where the higher speed motors are good, but I definitely want to put a 12,000 kV in there. Um, I've got one of them in my MRO3, no, no, my GL, uh, so my GL Racing rear wheel drive, and that thing is way too fast for any surface I've encountered, to the point where it's uncontrollable, it just spins out, um, even with like a whole lot of tweaking on the controller and that sort of thing. So let's put the cap on, and that arm's now long, no longer going up and down, so we're going to have to tweak that arm, but that's fine. I should have actually done that before I put these on now that I think about it, but we'll just roll with it. Let's go put you in there. And do that. And assess the back end. So not very good. So we know the bottoms are good, or at least reasonable. It's just going to be the top arms. So we use our magic tool. I must admit, I never actually use this for the intended purpose. Um, I always just put a plier behind the spur gear and pop it off that way. And in, in that case, it was just easy to twist it off. So we've got a stray scalpel. Let's put the cover on it. I've had too many, I've stabbed myself too many times to not do that. Um, we want you. And we want you. So we pick the non-polished side. And neither of these sides are polished, so we're just going to pick a random side. Push that in. Leave that in while I'm moving it because I need to know which, which side I enlarged. Um, and... The arm, the uh, swing arms do make this a bit more difficult, but it's a good time to get some practice in on this. Let's try the other side actually. It's a bit better. Let's do that. Check that there. Sometimes twisting can help a bit as well. You just have to be very, very careful when you apply that force. Goes in, goes over, that goes on. Almost there. I'm not happy with that slowness, so that's a good sign. Let's expand this a bit more. And let's just chuck that in. Actually, not having anyone in the chat room at the moment is good because I don't make do stupid things like talk about politics. And that's gone back to being really hard. So let's try the other side. I guess I put the wrong... Yep, so I just had the wrong side on there. We also rotate the swing arms a bit. And just make sure it works at all angles. 
Cool. So let's do the other side. Kind of glad that the tuning of this chassis is not taking nearly as long as I thought. Like six to eight hours is a big commitment on my part. And for a new person, someone new to the hobby, it might take probably up to 10 hours in total, especially with the tuning once you get onto the track. That's a non-trivial commitment. And, and you really want to do it in sizable chunks as well. Like I don't, I would be cautious about doing it in less than two hours at a time. Let's try that side. No. Let's ream it out a bit more. Bum, 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 bum. So one of the other interesting things is I picked up the Ensotec, the smaller Ensotecs. Now they're good up to 5,500 kV. Um, I normally get the ones that are good to up to 8,500. Because I ha actually have one or two of the, their older models, uh, older motors, that are the higher kV. I think they do a 6,500 and a, they used to do a 7,500. So I've got a couple of 7,500s laying around. Um, but they need the bigger controller. So I'm interested to see how the smaller controller goat works. Um, there's one or two models. I'm actually going to swap the speed controller over from the larger one to the smaller one. Just to save a bit of space. Uh, and I've also got the, the newer FlySky NB4 receiver units coming. The micro units. Um, so they will be good once they arrive. That's not really working for me, is it? Um, because the current full-sized ones are massive. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to find space for them on a Mini Z chassis. So, um, wouldn't mind getting, I, I don't really want to transponder my car. So I've been looking into uh, using a webcam to get lap timing. Um, Cause I've actually got a webcam that has a built-in uh, LiDAR unit. Um, to allow you to capture depth and I was planning to use that to um, track cars and do some track timing I need to revive that project it's been a while since I worked on it last there were some driver issues like Intel support for it is actually pretty bad it's like they, they create a, a product and then completely forget about it and Intel's pretty good at doing that don't really feel I'm making much progress on this side. Let's swap you over to the other side. Oh, that's a bit better. Good. Okay, let's try a different approach. Getting the, the strength behind these tips is actually pretty difficult. There we go. This is probably not the most efficient way to uh, ream out the heads, but it does allow me a significant amount of control. Water cooling on the machine just kicked in. Let's rain that out a bit more, and this time I'm going to get more of my body behind it. Oh, God. I mean, worst case scenario, I'll actually heat this up a bit in like boiling hot water and see if I can, if that helps to make it a bit more malleable. Okay, we're going to do two things. Where is my reamer? We're going to start with the reamer. Now, these are really sharp and dangerous objects, and that spike is very, very dangerous. P 
plus these get rusty. So um, if you've got cheap ones like I do. So be very, very careful with them. It's a very, very good way to end up in hospital. And we line that up again. Don't know if I'm particularly happy with these swing arms, but I, to me it doesn't matter nearly as much as the front suspension. Let's twist that over. So the next thing we're going to do take a small bit of sandpaper and just wrap it around a spare tool. In fact, I might do this one because it's got a slightly larger diameter. Wrap it like that. Just going to enlarge the dimensions a bit. So getting it twisted in is not the easiest thing, but once you do it, once you've got a bit of purchase, it should be a bit easier. Um, did that make a difference? I don't think it did. It's a bit more severe. Actually, I need to use a proper screwdriver head and insert it and then just leverage it out. There we go. Oh, and that actually just popped out. That's not good. Which means I might quickly just tighten that a tad bit more. Check the arm. It's good. Tighten a bit more. Still good. It's right on the limits there, so let's go with that. Oh man. Annoying. So what options do we have? I don't like this trick, but let's use a scalpel in, in place of a reamer. Just take some light amount of material off. Remember to go in both directions. in because you're now going all the way through oh that's interesting why is that happening no not enough and can I lever it up Why are you not coming? No, let's rotate you off. Okay. Uh, so I just pushed that in a bit too far. And I did that again. Okay, so I've... Let's try and be tricky and cap it at the top. There we go. Okay, I think I've actually got to use the other side because that side's now a bit too loose. 
But if I do that. Okay, so we know that works. We're just going to have to be very, very careful. Because I don't give you any spares of these, although these are what the ones I actually do have a lot of spares of, so not a problem really. Uh, almost there. Almost there. Any luck, this is it. Not as smooth as I'd like. What if I reverse the other side? Okay, that could be a bit smoother, but I want to move on at this point, so. There, there, okay. So now we're back onto carbon fiber. So we're getting real close to the end here. I think there's only really suspension after this. And then um, wheel, so. Let's talk about wheels just quickly. Um, let's work out what sort of wheels we want. So I've got some, I actually really like these metal ones, quite a fan of them, but I've got some more exotic ones. So these are from WL Toys. Um, got some plastic ones. I've also got these, which I do like using on the Porsches, so. Um, and funny enough, I've still got these from my original Mini Z. Um, so maybe I might give these a go because I do like the gold um, on them. Uh, so yeah, actually we'll go with those. Um, did I only get... There's no wide tyres here, so I think we'll go with the golds. Make it look fancy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's I doing? That and that. So I need... The balls for that, which are all in here. Just make sure we've got all the springs, yep. So what balls do they want? They want the ball heads. One. Two, three, four. Move that out of the way. Actually, let's put that in our tool bin. There we go. These are friction shocks, so I will need some grease for them as well. That's all right. We've got some of that handy. What screws do they want? They want the M24 bottom heads. One. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm definitely reaching my limit again. There's only so much you can do in one sitting. Although I think I've got a couple of days off next week, which should be fortuitous timing. Let's start with this part. I do like the black and the yellow contrast. That's actually a nice effect, so... Just have to make sure um, we're doing everything to the right side. Yep, so the easiest way is to actually put the button head in first, in the right hole, and then put the ball head in on top. Now, the astute among you will have noticed that the ball head is a hex and the screw is also a hex. 
So you either need two hex screwdrivers of the same side to fully drill these in, or you need an Allen key. And I think this one's a bit too small, but let's check. Yes, it is. It's probably one of the few times where I'd actually recommend the black Allen key it comes with, so. Put the Allen key like that in, like that. Hold that with the other hand and just twist in lightly. Not too much force. Like, as you can see, I'm only gripping it lightly and my fingers are slipping, so that's how I generally tell when I need to, uh, when I'm done. And again, so. And they're just slipping. You don't want to over torque these, you'll end up damaging the carbon fiber. And I have done this before, I've actually over torqued to where the, the carbon fiber here part broke and you couldn't use it anymore. It's not an issue with this because we've got like the both the long and the short arm suspension stuff. But I had, the one I had only had the, um, the one set of holes. Now I do actually have some long arm suspension somewhere. In fact, maybe I should look at that now before I, before I move on. So we've got, there we go, extended shock arms. First one I pull out, and then we've got like heads, and then we've got like ball diffs, and then like servos, and I've got like half a dozen belts because they're really handy to have. Um, here's a replacement so rear arms that I was talking about, so I actually broke this front one. This is for a DRZ. No, this is a BZ3. Oh. Um, belts, belts, tensioning, more belts, diffs, like metal, uh, metal arms. I need that to fix a broken part. Um, and the balance weights are handy. And then I've also got a whole lot of the like the ultra high quality belt diffs that just run so smooth. Like these are some of the, the best diffs I've ever seen. I don't know if they're the best, but they're just so smooth. Um, but once again, those are pulley belts. Uh, so they're, they're belt driven diffs. Um, so I don't have a lot of options to begin with anyway. So because we have this, let's just measure that up. So the heads are slightly longer. So we're actually going to change the mounting positions in that case. Luckily, because we only did it finger tight, it makes it easy to undo. And we're going to put you there. No, I think I want a more vertical angle. So let's put you there. Let's drill you in. It's also worth m mentioning that this has two flat sides. So if you do need to clamp it uh, because you don't have a hex uh, driver for it, that will also work. Um, it's also useful to note that that exists because it can make it easy to take them off if you've stripped a bolt head. So. Let's just do that. Because I really really definitely prefer the longer springs. The reason I prefer the longer springs is it just gives me more options in terms of dialing the springs in. So I can be less precise um, with how many rotations I do and get roughly the same effect. And did that come with springs? No, it didn't. So I'm going to have to probably bring my own springs to the game there. But as you've seen in previous videos, I've got a lot of springs available. Okay, and these are the middle. And in fact, I've got another three packets of springs coming. So it's probably... I was going to keep it a bit of a secret, but uh, I might mention it now. I went to the HRS... 
HRC website for the Hong Kong Racing Club. Um, and I went off and ordered a GL Drift chassis. Um, I'm a big fan of GL Racing. Like, I, don't get me wrong, I'm actually a big fan of Atomic as much as I, I um, go on about them all the time. I'm actually a massive fan of Atomic because they've got some really awesome ch and unique chassis. Um, but the GL Racing ones just go together so beautifully and like so little tweaking is needed. So I'm hoping to get the GL Drift car shortly and I also ordered the new Mercedes AMG body for it. Or just actually I don't know if I'll use it for that but um, I'm a big fan like there's a game called Need for Speed Hot Pursuit that I used to have on the Xbox that I absolutely loved and the AMG in that was I used my favorite car. So I just recently bought uh, Need for Speed Hot Pursuit again um, because it was only like three dollars on Steam um, and now I'll actually have the Mini Z car to race as well in a really really awesome livery um, but I really can't wait to play around with the GL Drift chassis and just contrast it to this chassis as well um, what else I also went to Tiny 4x4 and I've got a new four-wheel drive chassis coming it's the so if you've seen my pink Hummer that's actually not a Mini Z under the hood that's a completely custom build and I'm using an identical chassis to that, but in a longer uh, chassis frame. I think it's 130 millimeters. And I'm going to be making a off-road uh, off Dakar racing truck. The reason I'm using that chassis rather than anything Mini Z based is because it's got a lot more travel and the suspension is a lot more, a lot softer. It bounces a lot, lot more because there's no dampening, um, but I can fix that quite easily. Um, it, because I actually want to race that outdoors on rough terrain, uh, which you can't really do with any of the Mini Zs. Even the Orlandos, are, um, well, the Orlandos weren't too bad for that, but um, just had to be a bit careful. Okay. So let's compare the lengths. So those are fronts. Those are rears. That's a rear. There's a fronts. Now are all these the same? No. Good. And there's a fronts. Okay, so we're going to keep the fronts. Leave them there. Going to replace these rears. So this also comes with the uh, extra long shock mountings for the BZ3, which I'm not going to need. But I do want to compare the length on these. They are marginally longer. Okay, good. I do like these easy open containers. When you open enough of these containers, or you just have a bulk order and you're just working through them, it does make a huge difference. Okay, let's put the chassis aside for a moment. And take some time to look at the... Let's compare and contrast the longer. So you get about an extra millimeter or two. So let's convert over the configurable damper sleeve things I mean you can probably tell I'm getting very very tired now because I'm um, having trouble modulating my voice and just general lack of energy oh man maybe I will skip the uh, final stream today. I do want to play Battletech, that's the only problem. Although I could fire up No Man's Sky. I've got a lot of games I want to play and I'm actually putting aside the time to play them now. Um, like I've got a very very big backlog of old games from my youth and I really want to play them. Okay so that definitely needs some cleanup. That's appallingly bad. That's a lot of... can you see it on camera? Probably not. No. There's a whole lot of extra plastic on the end there, so. Let's 
especially inside a shock, you don't want that. In fact, we might even go so far as to polish the shocks up a bit. Yeah, I think we will. Um, where is the... Here we go. So shocks are something you don't want a tight fit for, especially if you're filling them with grease. You actually want there to be a bit of play. The reason for that is the grease needs to fit between the inner and the outer shock. So um, I do have a grease kit, so let me grab that. So this is from Miracle Mart. This is the uh, official atomic grease kit. I think I will probably be going with the 2500. There we go. It doesn't need much work. If anything, you actually probably want um, a rough finish on the inner shocks just because that helps retain the grease. And keep in mind, every time the shock pops off, uh, you may need to re-grease it. As I've found out many times. Let's just do a test fit. See a bit of a sprue line there, and I can feel a bit of tension, so I'm going to try and get rid of that. Um, if I can find, there you are. I said you only just need to drag along it to remove it, so. Just keep in mind it takes off an actually a fairly large amount of plastic if you push hard enough so I mean it doesn't even have to be perfectly round it's just got to be smaller cool and then we do a test fit again Yep, no binding. Excellent. Let's look at number two. Oh, there's a tiny bit of binding. It's not necessarily binding from sprue though. A lot of it's suction. And you'll actually find when you fill it with grease, you can hear that suction sound. So I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I've never really kind of looked into it. I haven't been able to find a lot of information on tuning shocks, so... Definitely doing a lot of polishing today. As someone said the other day, it's like, uh, I came here to see you polish shafts and I'm not seeing enough of it. It's like, well, that's actually against um, Twitch's terms and conditions, so... Okay, so they're moving really, really smoothly. Um, I'm going to actually grease them up now and actually build the entire shock. Uh, let's move you out of the way. Let's check if this spring is actually long enough. So we put the spring over the top there. And I've got race springs, which I'll put on later, but... I'm just wondering if I want a longer spring. You know, actually, I was going to say, I thought I might want to put a longer spring on it, but what I can do is I can just adjust the, uh, the preload on the spring with this uh, silver collar. So I'll just do that. If I go the other way. There we go. Cool. So I'll show you how I uh, build these shocks. And to start with, um, you actually want the collar all the way up and then to adjust it on the body. Um, it just makes getting the springs on and off a lot easier. So let me just back that out. So I take the, uh, the pin or whatever and then just dip it in like that and bob it around a bit and then just wipe the excess off on the side. So you want a bit on the bottom like that. 
Uh, it's probably a bit too much on there, so. But that's fine, you'll actually find it squeezes out. And then, just slide it in like that. Move it back and forward a bit. Now I'm not hearing any suction sounds, which is good. And you can see there's a bit of excess and you want to wipe that off because mini Zs and stuff in the scale actually get very, very dirty. Um, the amount of, like the, the rubber on the tires is actually incredibly soft and you'll just end up contaminating the, uh, the shock because it'll get on the outside and then get drawn in. So let me just do that again. Let's put that in like that. Twirl it around a bit. Wipe off the excess. Now uh, 25,000 weight, which is what I'm using here, is actually not that sticky. I could have actually gone up to the 3,500, which I've got. Um, and that might have been more appropriate, but I think I only want light damping. I, I, as I said, I don't understand enough about shocks to really be able to comment either way. Um, that seems relatively good though. And I do have to keep in mind that I'm using the longer shocks here, which have more material. There's more of an interface layer between the two surfaces. It's mediated by the dampening fluid. So that does give it more opportunity to dampen. In fact, I forgot to put the springs on, which was silly of me. The other nice thing about the oil is it helps keep the uh, spring together. Don't rely on that, but it does make getting some of the parts on a tiny bit easier. There you go. Cool, so that's the rear shocks done. Let's move on to the front shocks. It's gonna be pretty much the same process here, but um, we put it in, we do a test fit. That's exceptionally tight. In fact, I, I wanna put the springs on here and just check one thing. Oh yeah, okay, so they've got Okay, that's not too bad. Take the spring off again. So let's start working on that. Let's try out the other one. Oh yeah, that's... I'm actually having to pull that out, so... First we check for the sprue lines. Uh, if I can find my scalpel. Make sure I've got the right light on it, because that really helps. So I'm actually just using an RC pit light at the moment to give me a very, very white light. Uh, the colour of the light is actually really important. So I could just use my overhead lights, but I've got very, very warm globes. And the white light just brings out small details a lot better. So it makes precision work like this a lot simpler. Let's see how that changed things. There weren't any sprue lines there. So I think the sandpaper is probably going to be our best trick here. Mm-hmm. Okay, and just a bit of a time bit of time, just go slowly. So I can feel that's making a difference. I might actually go up to a more aggressive sandpaper. So this is the P1000. It just takes off more material at a time with slightly deeper cuts. And that's still pretty tight. So these shocks are going to be incredible when I'm done. I normally don't tune my shocks to this level, but uh, I'm really focusing on how much tuning I can get into the chassis. Okay, now I can see a sprue line. Take you. Rotate it slightly while I do that. This side as well. So I mean if I've gone to the effort to make the front suspension as good as possible, it would be a mistake to not pay the same attention with the uh, the shocks. So it should pay for itself rather nicely. Even if it does cost my sanity.
And these seem like they're going to, going to need a lot of work. So I'm guessing the other shocks I had were of much higher precision than this. Oh God, they're still really bad. They're getting better. Actually, what I need to do, so I've got an electric screwdriver here and it's got a notched end there and I should be able to just insert it like that and rotate. Nope, okay. Worth a try. I might have to make a jig or something for that in the future. Okay, do another test fit. So that's not bad, but I know I can do better. One more pass. There we go. Hmm, I'm actually still inclined to go even further still just the slightest bit of binding. Oh, how's that? Perfect. And then if I go like that. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Take off a tiny bit more. I mean, at the end of the day, the suspension is going to be provide frictional binding. So I guess it's more about it being smooth than anything else. Yeah. So I'm happy with that. Let's go to the next one. So I can, feel it, I can actually feel it clicking in, which is not good. And then rotating it doesn't do nearly as well. Does this rotate? Yeah, this spins really, really well. Um, Bum, bum, bum. So if I break off this, and how long have I been stringing for? Oh wow, so we're over the two hour mark. And what's the time? It's now 3.18, so I might even go all the way to four and do a three hour, just because I think I can finish it in this go, in this sitting. God, these front shocks require a lot of work. Okay, so that's spinning a lot nicer now. Um, there's a bit of suction and I can now see the sprue line, so I'm gonna try and take that off. God, I need to get a CNC machine. This would be, and start making my own parts. It'd be so much nicer. Been gradually getting up to speed on CNC machining with an eye to start custom fabricating chassis and starting se starting to sell them, but it's going to take a while. In fact, I can see a visible bulge. So the actual end here is actually larger than the inner side. So that gives me some hints as to where I need to spend my time and effort. I'll actually focus on the end in that case um, and move in and out while I'm doing it to give me additional cutting. And yeah, like I can actually feel it when I pull it out. It gets to about the very end and then you can feel it get a lot larger. So oh, that's the 1000. I might even give it a light pass over this just to cut off a lot of material. No, I think this one's really badly de deformed. And I'm not going to shake the table too hard. Don't want to give the neighbors a wrong impression. There we go. Back for 3,000. Oh, actually, no, I wanted the 1,000. That's where I went wrong. Uh, 
Okay. Very, 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 very slowly making progress. And unfortunately, I'm looking at my Formula One right now. So let me bring that into view. I'm looking at, at the Formula One right now and really wanting to finish that. So maybe. So like I didn't have to do any tuning on this one and the suspension is near perfect. So maybe this is a GL Racing GLF1. Might save that one till next weekend, I think. I hear that they turn like crazy, so I'm very interested to see how they go on my small track. Okay, I'm going to bring the rest off with a uh, scalpel, I think. I'm just trying to go evenly all over the place as best I can. It seems like a pretty effective way of removing material so far. I do need to get some more scalpel blades now that I think about it. Oh, we're getting there. I wish I didn't have to keep on saying that though. Try and keep it even. Okay, that's starting to work. I should be fine with the P1000 sandpaper. So I can see at least one other person is actually watching at the moment. I congratulate you in doing that. I can't imagine I'm too interesting. Um, but hopefully you're here for the DRZ or you're looking at building one yourself and you're learning a couple of things to make this a bit easier. Which is the entire, that's the entire reason I'm streaming this to be honest. Is to just try and help people out. So I've got another bump in the middle it feels like. Um, so once I take that out it should be perfect. I had hoped, hoped to finish this this weekend. Okay, that's good. I'm going to just take a tiny bit more off. Um, just to be sure. It doesn't matter if you remove too much material on the shocks, luckily. Um, it's not a precision part uh, laterally. It's a precision part vertically. So... Yeah, I actually probably still want a bit more. It just seems like this one shock was really, really poorly uh, deformed. So I just do want to make sure it's as good as I can make it. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. Oh, awesome. Uh, let's shock the, uh, let's grease these shocks up. Not to be too greasy, but Australians will get that joke. Cool. Push that in. Pull it in and out, no suction noise, which means we've probably got the shot perfect. Clean up the excess. Actually, the best way to do that is to rotate that side. Okay. Visually inspect the shock. That looks good. Put a spring on before you forget. So definitely one of the things that's really helped me with building mini, mini Zs is working with a keyboard all day. Um, I wouldn't say I've got great movement and articulation in my fingers, but it's good enough. And I also need to wind those front shocks back a bit. There we go. Let's 
just put the spring on first so I don't forget. And dip, twirl, make sure it goes all the way to the top. Wipe off the excess. And insert. And that actually makes it really hard to clean off the shock. That's why I did the spring last. Okay, lessons learned. So it means you, what ends up happening is you get grease on the spring and that's hard to clean off, which means it accumulates dirt. I mean, on the bigger RC cars, you can put like a sock over the, uh, the spring. And by sock, they normally just use a balloon or something like that. Um, on the Mini Zs, you don't really have that option because it introduces too much friction and too much force. So there's a couple of ways to solve it. Um, one of my personal favorite ways to solve that is to just buy new Mini Zs. Um, very, very bad joke, I know, but it's the only joke I know. Okay, so we're going to put the ball heads in on the car first. And these are hexes. Bingo. So it's very obvious which hole they go in. And I must say, it is actually nice to see that the, um, all the screws are going in very nicely. So that is a nice change. Um, if they can get the quality issues under control, I'd be exceptionally happy with Atomic. And in fact, I really hope they watch this video and get some ideas. Um, or even if they tried to contact me, I'd be more than willing to provide feedback. Um, but if they're looking at a way to do everything properly, uh, have a look at the Techno EB410 manual or anything from Techno. Those manuals are exceptional. Why aren't you going in? Let's try and enlarge you a bit just to make sure and put you back on. Okay, we may have to put some force behind this, but the reason why you don't want to do, put force behind a screw when you're driving it in is if you go off angle, that's retained, good. Uh, if, if you go in at an angle, um, you end up doing pretty bad damage to the chassis. So. I don't feel that's actually going in all that well. So I'm going to swap over to that one. And hopefully that was threaded enough that I can just, yeah, it was. I can just put that in there and have it rest and then drive the screw in. And that's, yep, yeah, that's biting and going in. So I'm going to put that ball head aside because I don't think it's a good one. Okay, that's providing a bit of resistance. So we stop there. Um, as I said, plastic will retain everything nicely, so you don't have to worry about it too much. That's weird. Oh, that, that goes to the front, that's why. Okay. Um, so they want the M27s. Oh, interesting. What's an M27? Really? Okay. That looks like an M4, but that looks also looks like it's a better fit. Yeah, that does look like a good fit. So why would you tell me to use the M? I'm going to cheat and not follow their instructions, which is pretty typical of me. Um, where it gets interesting is if you are follow their instructions the first time and then make the decision to change later, you may end up with issues with the threads that you've cut into the plastic and the parts won't fit well the second time. So if you're going to diverge from the plans, you want to make that decision the first time around rather than the second. Oh, actually, these are M2. What am I, what am I kidding? Yeah, these are M27s. I was thinking of M4s being the M2s I've been using, but it's been M2, M, 
M24s I've been using. So these are the right screws. Ah, oh, stupid me. So M2 is uh, metric 2, which should just be 2mm across. And there should be a standard profile in terms, in terms of the spline on the screw itself. So they should be roughly equivalent unless otherwise specified. Okay, so that's now attached. And I'm going to put the long shocks on and do a test fit. If I can work out which ones are the long shocks. In fact, that's actually rather difficult. There we go. There's the long... Um, now we're just checking to see which side is shiny and which one's not because the shiny side goes onto the head yep it's that shiny side and they're fairly loose already which is good I won't have to tune that Oh wow, that's really, that's interesting. Why is that so far out? My shocks are not that long. Are those really the long, you know what? I am actually wondering if Miracle Mart has longer shocks as an option that's coming. Maybe they do, in which case I'm probably going to back this out and change the screw hole positions again. So I'm guessing the long BRZ shocks are different to the... Uh, so long BZ shocks are different to the long DRZ shocks. That's fine, at least we discovered it now rather than later. And come on... In fact, what we're going to do is use the electric screwdriver for a bit. Because I am sick and tired of screwing around. Yes, that was a pun. Yes, I intended it. Deal with it. If I can actually find a normal head. Uh, maybe I don't have one of those heads. Oh, unless you are. You're a pin head. Oh, there, there you are. You're the one I'm looking for. So the nice thing about this screwdriver is it takes the same heads as this. So they're nice and easy to swap around. And I can just twist like that. So let's back that out. Okay, that's looking good. Come off. There we go. Replace it. Supply finger pressure. Nice and quick. Now for the M4s, I normally wouldn't bother with the electric screwdriver. Um, but for the M7s, it definitely makes a bit more sense. Uh, the other reason I'd want to use that screwdriver is I can set the amount of torque on the screwdriver so I can ensure that they're torqued, all the screws are torqued to the same level. And that can be important sometimes. You don't want to over tighten. And it just, that the electric screwdriver actually just prevents me from uh, making screws too tight. But you'll see why I use it primarily, which is speed in a minute. Done, done. Let's chuck you on there. So we'll just get them started. Twist. Whoops. One twist, two twists. And chuck you in. Yeah, that's a good mate. Done. 
So that's the reason why you want an electric screwdriver. Uh, there's cheap ones and there's expensive ones. I've got an expensive one. Um, they're not the expensive ones aren't that much better than the cheaper ones, but uh, I like the company that makes the expensive ones. I've got a lot of their tools, um, and I've got a lot of their test equipment, and I just love the. Um, I love that everything's open source and that there's now third-party firmware available because of that. Um, so I'm more than willing to spend the extra money to support them. Okay, so we just pop that on with that. There we go. So we now have a actively dampened rear arm. Mm-hmm. So I did hear that the company that makes my electric screwdriver, so my soldering iron, a TS100, this is a TS100P, and I've also got a TS100. Um, they also make this, which is the electric screwdriver, the ES120. Um, and this is the, uh, the one with the extra torque. Um, I've also got their electric power supply stuff, um, their configurable bench power supply, which is also really, really handy great and handy to have, and I've used in the field. Uh, funny enough for charging mini Z's as well, which is even funnier. Wait, is that a shock? Oh, that was a shorter shock, wasn't it? Um, I hear they're about to bring out a logic, uh, like an, I think it's an electrical test probe or something like that. So that'll be interesting. Although um, I backed a Kickstarter for a, um, a small test USB test kit. So it's like a handheld multimeter and Really, really small, plugs in via USB, charges via USB, it's got Bluetooth and all of that. But the company that makes that uh, actually just works down the road from me. So I could literally walk to their offices right now and they're about five minutes away. Wait, have I really screwed these shocks up? No, they're both the same size. Why don't they seem to be... Oh, okay, because one's already pre got some preload on it. Okay, so let's add some preload. There we go. So now everything's now... I hate that everything's reversed. I might need to reverse my web camera to get around that. Uh, everything's about level. So let's play around the rear suspension a bit. That's looking good. That, that's feeling incredible. Um, like I've got a lot of mini, mini Z's and I've dealt with a lot of uh, rear suspension setups and that feels incredibly good. And even the gears now actually seem a lot looser and a lot smoother. So um, everything's falling into place. Actually, interesting, having a look at that. So look where my cursor is. Those screws, they actually don't list a size. Um, they look like M27s, but it's kind of interesting that they forgot that. So once again, really bad quality control. <laughs> Exceptionally bad quality control. Um, but we can work around that. It's not a major DL breaker. And actually, it's a bit of a preview. So we've got the two parts, and if we mate them together... Oops starting to look like an actual chassis now so that is some significant progress right there oh I just lost light um, okay so my camera is really good and it's compensating but it's actually quite dark here now uh, that's right. There's enough light for me to continue, but if it gets any darker, I might have to switch on some more lights. And it will start to get darker because it's getting on to four o'clock, so. But that's fine. We should be ending, finishing up soon. If I can get the top plate on and to step... Oh, step 21's attached the servo. Do I want to do that now? That is technically electronics. So I actually have that on speed mode, not talk mode, which is bad of me, but that's fine. Let's check that the rear end is loose. 
Yep. So I actually fixed up the uh, the rear end a bit off camera as well, so it's really nice and smooth. Um, bam. So we're just installing shocks. So I just need some ball ends, which should be you and you. And I should actually refer to the instructions. Yes, ball head. Cool. Because like I could build this totally blind with no instructions. Um, would be a bit of effort, but I can definitely do it. Basically by making up stuff as I go. So this is metal on metal as well. Um, I should Loctite that, but there should be very, very little friction that should cause this to unwind. If I do encounter an issue down the track, I will go off and um, Loctite it. For the moment, I think I want the flexibility to be able to remove it and replace it at a later date with the Monoshock. So going with a Loctite would actually be a bit of a mistake in that regard. And this ball end doesn't seem to be going in. Interesting. So we're going to take a closer look at that and work out why that appears to be so much of an issue. It looks like the thread might be partially damaged on that one. So just let me look through my pipe spin for a replacement. Um, maybe I'll have to go to one of my seal bags. Otherwise I do have a sacrificial model I can pull uh, apart from. Because these uh, four millimeter ball ends are pretty common across the entire uh, DRZ range. Uh, so, well, the DRZ range, like I've got a DRZ, I can pull it off. So, there you are. You are extended shocks. So, you're not what I want. Um, Okay, I'm going to have to make a trip to the other room where I've got all those parts. Oh, one moment. Okay, and we're back. So I also took the opportunity to uh, grab some servos. I like these servos. 
highly recommended by uh, Beaver Hobbies. Ultra high speed, a lot of torque, all metal. Come in both uh, JST and the standard plug. So it's a JST plug. Um, so we will be using one of these because we want speed with a drift car. So I grabbed some various ball ends and we're going to see which one fits best. So these are not flanged and large. So likely that one. Yep, that looks like a good match. And I'm just going to take the moment to compare the thread. Yeah, the thread seems a lot better on this one, so... And that's going in really smoothly. Okay, perfect. I was a bit concerned because this other ball head had some black on it, which indicates it scraped off some of the paint. And I was really hoping that didn't thread the... Um, the actual metal and end up ruining it so that's good they look the same and that was just taken off my um my drz so i've actually got that in pieces at the moment because i've had some alignment issues with it and i honestly don't know if i'm going to rebuild it after this so um, it's been better as a parts car than anything else uh, i think we'll come in via the top for this one so let's clamp them on from the top Oh, okay, that's got a lot of friction. That'll need to be fixed up. Let's try that. Maybe not. Now, the other thing I'm making sure to do is put the uh, silver collars at the top, just so it has less of an opportunity to interfere with the suspension. Okay, so this definitely needs to be reamed out a bit. So does this one. I don't want any real pressure on the front suspension at all. And I don't think this is going to work. I think this is actually wider. Oh, it does just. Uh, it's right at the limit of that one, so I'm going to have to use that. Rotate that a bit. Let's do that and see if that makes a difference. And now squeeze like that. Okay, so it's looser. Um, so we'll give it one more go. And see what of how much of a difference that makes, and whether or not we want to find something a bit better. Yeah, that's almost there. Okay, I do want to see if I've got anything bigger laying around. Doesn't look like I do. And finding a canonical tip like that is actually probably going to be a bit difficult. Okay, that made a huge difference, I think. Mm, really still kind of want that to come out on its own. So we're going to try a different tactic to what we've done, done in the past and actually enlarge it from the inside. It's a bit more of a risk with the small ones because you can end up putting too much force and breaking it, but with the larger ball heads. Speaking of larger ball heads, why am I even bothering to do it that way? This is where the Dremel approach actually works better with the bigger ones. In fact, I forgot to take that um, ball head out of here previously anyway. So we can actually use a damaged ball head which is really really nice. So it's still actually useful to us which is great news. Yep 
Yeah, I'm gonna need a bigger retaining chalk. Oh. It's really nice having everything on hand. Nope, I'm gonna have to make do with that. Okay. So what we do is pull that out and then we force it in while it's not in the device. There we go. Let's move that out of the way before I forget. And then turn the retention clip on. And then that looks like that. So you can see it's in the end there. Then we just put it on. Actually, that's interesting. That's going to interfere with the shock itself. So I can do the bottom one. No, I can't. Wow, it doesn't actually stick out far enough. Maybe I can pull it out a bit further. Or maybe I can time that down more. No, okay. Looks like that might not be an option either. Final option is to not use a retaining clip at all um, and just have the head there. But I want to check if that actually works. <coughs> yep, that still rotates, so that'll work. And that should also limit the amount of friction in there as well. <coughs> so you just want to rotate it gently when this is all happening as well. Um, just to uh, get all the angles worked out on that. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have to pull it out again. And this is going to be a very laborious task, I think. Next week on Jay-Z Builds me Z's. Oh God. There we go. Then we force it back in. Then we find the shiny side. Plug it into the shiny side and spin it up. And don't take it off while it's spinning. Um, that is a recipe for disaster. So let's check that now. Yep. Almost. I'm going to call that good enough. Um, I don't really want to put too much extra work into that. Okay. Look at how we clamp that. And then we provide a bit of preload. A bit more than that. And there we have it. It's no real magic, just a lot of hard, hard, hard work. And it's why the advanced kits only come as kits and rather than pre-built, because the amount of manpower, if you're talking about, I'd say 10 hours worth of work, and no one in their right mind would commit 10 hours worth of work to this commercially, but 10 hours worth of work at 200 bucks a pop, you're looking at 200 bucks just in build costs. Um, and that might not be profitable and I'm sure there's other locations in the world where that is actually profitable but uh, at least local, local to Australia that's not going to happen I can't see myself paying $200 in build costs when um, uh, the kit costs almost about that much as well
making sure I do the shiny side. Clamp it. Actually, let's bring it forward a bit. I shouldn't be leaning back like that, but I'm doing that because of the light. Okay, so that's still very, very stiff. Let's push all that back in. Do that, clamp it back like that. Oh man, that's still really, really bad. Okay. So that means that rear shock at the bottom there is probably a bit stickier than it needs to be. Uh, let's try reaming it out again. And I'm really starting to notice the light disappearing at, at my end, so we definitely are going to be finishing up after this. Is that much of an issue? Maybe not. Let me rotate that in. I'm going to do a test fit and see what it's like and make a call. There we go. And let's put some preload on. This is where it's really helpful to have nails. Uh, just to grip all those little divots in the side. more preload and even more than that maybe I can take some preload off the other side but I just want the preloads to match okay so they're not even um, but I'm pretty happy with that like I can actually feel the dampening in that which is pretty good. Um, we're going to take a peek at the next step. Okay. I could get that done, but to be honest, I think it's probably a good time to end. Um, thanks for joining me. Um, there will be another session over the next couple of days. Uh, I'll probably fit it in between 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock on either Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I'm pretty sure I have Thursday and Friday off and we'll see what I end up doing there. It'll probably be a bit of drifting practice. So hopefully I'll see you then and uh, thanks for joining me. Goodbye.